Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be talking about thermoregulation. Now, thermoregulation is a key part of what we call homeostasis. Now, homeostasis is a scientific word that means the maintenance of a constant internal environment. Now, when we talk about internal environment, we essentially mean blood and tissue fluid. And we ensure that the body maintains levels of essentially everything that it needs to in the blood and tissue fluid to be healthy. Now, thermoregulation in cold-blooded animals, organisms, is, is very different to warm-blooded, which is what I'm going to focus on in this video. For cold-blooded animals, or, or ectotherms as they're referred to, they rely on the external temperature because they don't have these mechanisms. So if they're in a hot environment, their temperature will rise. If they're in a cold environment, their temperature will lower. But I'm going to focus on warm-blooded organisms and how they regulate their temperature. So on this first page, I've got some key terms here. Set point, receptor, controller, effects, run feedback loop. Just going to explain why I have them there. In, we're going to sort of pin this topic on those key terms. And the picture of the cat was just merely for cuteness. So let's start here. Set point. A set point is, is where our body sort of ideally likes to be at. Now in terms of temperature, let's we we'll take this 37 degrees C. A set point is what we try, what our body tries to keep at a constant value. Now temperature can actually range, we can go from about 36.5 to 38 degrees Celsius really before we become too cold or hypothermic or too hot, which is hyperthermic. So we're going to try and keep it at 37. Now, if there's a slight deviation from our set point, then our receptors will pick that up. Now, in this case, for temperature control, we have thermoreceptors in both the skin and in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. So they will detect deviations from that set point. So if it goes slightly above 37 or below, the receptors will pick it up. And they'll pass that information to the controller. Now the controller in thermoregulation is actually called the thermoregulatory center. And it's in the hypothalamus itself. And once triggered, that thermoregulatory center will bring about a change or response by activating these effectors. So effectors are things in the body that will bring about that change. Now just for completeness sake, I've put the words here, feedback loop. And it's because that effector ultimately is feeding back information. It's getting us back to set point. It's an example of what's called negative feedback. So if our set point rises, or rather if we, if our temperature rises above set point, rather, the effect will bring it down. So we have a kind of reverse effect. If our temperature goes lower than set point, the effect is will have to bring it back up. And that's what we call negative feedback. We're almost switching off the corrective mechanism. I think you, at A level it goes into a bit more depth than it would at GCSE, but we ultimately have this negative feedback. So we start at set point, Changes are picked up by a receptor, they're back to a controller who brings about changes in the body via effectors. So what we're going to do now is focus on a cross-sectional diagram of skin, because most of the effectors actually revolve around this picture. So we've got here a diagram of the skin. Now a lot of these labels for parts we're not going to refer to. We're going to just focus in on the sweat gland, the erector pili, the hair shaft. We're going to look at these arterials the and leading into the capillaries at the surface of the skin. And in fact, we're going to reduce this down in size just so that I can put some comments around the outside. Now, Let's think when the body is hot. So when our core temperature has risen. So that's what we're going to look at first. 
when our core temperature has risen, when we've gone above set point. So when you are hot, a number of effectors essentially kick in and bring about the change to lower that temperature. The first thing that happens is we sweat. So we have, so I'm only going to make a few brief notes on that side, but I'll explain them more fully. So when that temperature rises, core temperature rises, the sweat gland will activate. And that will release sweat, and you can see it will release sweat here onto the surface of the skin. Now in an exam, that wouldn't get you any marks. The next bit would. It's what happens to that sweat. When the sweat evaporates from the skin, it carries the heat energy away with it. So the sweat gland will produce sweat, it will be released onto the surface of the skin, and then it will evaporate, carrying that heat energy away. So let's think about why I've circled the hair. Now, when your core temperature rises, what you'll notice is that that hair lays flat. And it lays flat because the erector pili muscle is relaxed. So the erector pili muscle is relaxed and it keeps the hairs laying flat on the surface of the skin. And that stops you trapping a, a sort of layer of insulating air almost around the skin. And it's just one mechanism the body's employed to sort of aid the drop, the needed drop in temperature. Because the last thing we want is this layer of insulating air that's going to trap heat around the skin. So we sweat, the sweat gland activates, the erector pili relaxes to allow the hairs to lay flat. And a third thing that happens relates to the capillaries in the surface of the skin. When they're hot, what we get is something called vasodilation. I'll just explain what that is. Vaso refers to the vessel and dilation means to widen. So often students get confused and say that the blood vessels move to the surface of the skin. They don't. They're already there. They just widen. And when they widen, it means that more blood can flow to the surface of the skin. And heat energy is carried in the blood. So it allows that blood to come closer to the surface of the skin and allow the heat energy to radiate out. So it's a way of losing that heat energy. So when our core temperature rises, we get vasodilation. Blood vessels near the surface of the skin widen, allow more heat energy to flow and more heat to be lost. And that's why you can see when you're hot, you go sort of red in the face. That redness is because your blood vessels have widened. So that, they're the three key essential things of what happens when our core temperature increases. Let's now just think about when our core temperature actually goes down. So when we deviate from set point, but by getting colder. So it's almost like the reverse of what we've just said. This time, we have no sweat. And again, I'll explain it further. So our sweat gland will remain inactive. The last thing we want is to lose heat through sweat evaporating. So when we're cold, we don't sweat. When we're cold, this time we get contraction of the erector pili. So the hairs, this time, stand up. And that traps a layer of insulating air to keep us warmer to try and raise that core temperature. So the hair stand up, but that's because the erector pili muscle, this one here, contracts and pulls that hair shaft up. And you might have guessed, we're gonna get something called vasoconstriction. Now, vaso again, vessel constriction is becoming narrower. So our blood vessels near the surface of the skin actually narrow to reduce heat loss. And by narrowing, essentially they have less blood flowing near the surface of the skin. So there's less chance for heat to, to escape. In fact, we direct that 
heat more and the blood more to our vital organs away from the surface of the skin and that's why someone if they they seem cold they actually look a bit paler it's because when they have that blood being diverted away from the surface of the skin they have vasoconstriction blood vessels narrowing so less blood flows through that vessel thus less heat is lost and radiated out now when the temperature goes down we actually have two other special mechanisms, two of the effectors that we involve. And one of them is the skeletal muscle. Now the skeletal muscle basically just involuntary contracts. Now that is what we know as a shiver. So we, we shiver, we get shivering and our muscles involuntary contract and what we do is try and produce heat energy from those contractions to try and raise our core temperature. And the fifth and final effector comes from the glands. Now it actually comes from the, adre the adrenal glands, little glands that sit almost on top of the kidneys. The adrenal glands release adrenaline. An adrenaline hormone increases metabolism. So we'll put it increased. Metabolism via adrenaline. Now, when we increase metabolism, so all of our sort of chemical reactions in the body, as a result, so we talk about respiration here, when we increase respiration, we'll get more energy produced, more heat energy, and that will raise our core temperature. So when our core temperature ultimately lowers, just go through in the top so we don't sweat the sweat gland stays inactive the hairs will stand up to trap a layer of heat we have vasoconstriction to prevent heat loss we shiver to generate energy and we increase metabolism via the release of adrenaline hormone to produce more heat energy now they are really the fundamentals in thermoregulation these mechanisms are how warm-blooded organisms like ourselves control our temperature now I've not delved in this video into hypo and hypothermia. So hypo is low, hypothermia is too low temperature. Hyperthermia, so PER hyperthermia is when we go too hot. So we're into our extremes here. Now when someone, just say briefly, when someone gets hyperthermia, so too hot, they become nauseous, get fainting, dizziness, can get heat stroke. Severe dehydration, death could ensue. Equally, when we go too cold, you can get very many of the similar symptoms again, and, and death can still occur. And with those two conditions, I mean, there's a variety of sort of at risk groups, but particularly the elderly and the very, very young babies, because their thermoregulatory mechanisms don't work as effective at those sort of times or periods in life as they would normally would. That's just a little bit on hypo and hypothermia. But in exam questions, you'd typically be expected to know the key components of when we deviate from set point, when the temperature goes up, when the temperature goes down, so we go higher or lower than what our set point is. You'd be expected to know these multiple mechanisms that we have regarding the sweat gland, the hairs, the erector pili muscle, and the blood capillaries, and even the glands and the skeletal muscles as part of homeostasis. Just as a final thing, when um, discussing mechanisms in, or res that respond to cold, so a drop in that set point, there are organisms that actually have quite a few specialist things. Um, and th this is more sort of toward an A-level, but there are what are called extremophiles, which are organisms that actually can live in extreme temperatures. So they have enzymes that operate most effectively at sort of extremes of cold or extremes of hot. So one example is the Thermus aquaticus um, bacterium that found in hot springs, the enzyme of which is used in the PCR polymerase chain reaction. Um, there are organisms that have antifreeze proteins. 
And even the penguin has in the feet something called the counter-current mechanism. It's a way of actually conserving heat. So you have where it has two vessels flowing in opposite directions. And if, if it wants to retain heat, heat energy can essentially be transferred from one vessel directed away from the central part of the body. And it can pass back into a blood vessel to be carried back into the core of the body. Okay, hope all that helps.